Is it okay? Yes, fine. <laughs> Great. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank organizers for inviting me. It was a pleasure to see uh, Misha Lokov <laughs> in particular after many years. So, I will tell uh, about some uh, results concerning uh, conformal anomaly, which are more or less recent, I would say, last six years. And the plan will be the following. Uh, first, I will give some uh, review of conformal symmetry in general and classical level, then discuss randomization in conformal uh, semi-classical gravity and uh, general structure of conformal anomaly, which breaks uh, classical conformal symmetry. And then we discuss uh, the most uh, difficult mathematically point, which is the relation between surface and topological terms, which uh, we can actually uh, call the conformal features of, of the uh, topological term. Then we go to anomaly-induced effective action, because this relation, which I mentioned, is exactly important for this. And then I will discuss some, uh, let's say, risky issue. Is anomaly compatible with renormalizability? and uh, give short discussion show you very briefly uh, what is local what we can uh, uh, how the ambiguities in the uh, in anomaly and anomaly induced action can help us in principle to have a normalizable conformal theory which is a non-trivial issue and finally i will show the last uh, our one of our last results on the low energy limit in the anomaly induced action so in principle, let me just say that uh, all this is a small part of what I could present because I could not fit everything in a short talk because it's a big subject. So the first point is that uh, some examples of conformal uh, models uh, should probably start with the scalar field. And uh, this is the example of scalar field. Uh, in four dimensions, you see that he, we see that here is one over six uh, non-minimal parameter and no mass, of course. And then this action is invariant un under this uh, local conformal transformation. It's called local because uh, sigma depends on x. So another example is a massless spinner. Uh, it also, also can couple to vector or axial vector field which is equivalent to anti-symmetric torsion. The same is true, by the way, for the scalar field. You can generalize it in several ways, like complex scalar fields, couple it to vector, to axial vector, and so on. Here, we also have, in the spinner case, we also have uh, symmetry. Uh, it's interesting that both these models can be easily generalized to arbitrary dimension. Uh, the next example is electromagnetic field. You can generalize it to Young-Mills, but here, uh, it's, there is no straightforward generalization uh, to arbitrary dimension. However, there are like three or four different schemes uh, to go to arbitrary dimension. But you have to sacrifice something, either uh, gauge symmetry or uh, introduce color field or uh, give up from uh, uh, locality of the action. Or uh, you have non-polynomial action if you want, and then you, you get your conformal environment. There are three basically different lines for this. Then we have uh, local uh, conformal uh, gravity, poor gravity theory with the square of the wild tensor. Uh, this can also be generalized to arbitrary dimension, but in the same way as electromagnetic field. I will not discuss this part. Just a second. Sorry. OK, sorry. So uh, the, the next example, which is very important for us, is this. It is a scalar field with four derivatives. This scalar is different because it does not transform under conformal transformation. It was originally introduced by Fratkin and Saitlin in 82 in, uh, in, as part of the program related to conformal supergravity. And then uh, Pan Aids wrote this famous uh, preprint. And so people used to call it Pan Aids operator, uh, this delta 4. Uh, for us, it will be very important. I will use a lot uh, this Panate operator. The next is uh, uh, 
the example which I thought I invented, but it turned out that it's long known. So it's anti-symmetric uh, tensor field. It may be uh, conformal invariant. Then the general version coupled to fermion is like this, but you have to put, of course, masses equal to zero. Um, and then you we see that this conformal action is, uh, first of all, includes this omega-4, which is a conformal bilinear operator. It was discovered originally by Branson in 82. And then there are some different aspects of this were discussed. And uh, my mentioned paper is this one. So uh, the preprint. So there are like uh, four force power inter self interactions. You can couple it to fermion. And so, in general, it's quite interesting uh, expression with a new kind of non-minimal term interacting to wild tensor. Uh, it's very important that this uh, action is... Uh, oh, good. Sorry. No, I am lost. I am completely lost. Yeah, so it's important that this action is different from the gauge invariant, more, much more explored gauge invariant version of the anti-symmetric tensor field. Uh, and uh, this means that there is no gauge invariance in this action. And uh, as a price to pay, you have probably here uh, not positively defined Hamiltonian and a large chance to have a ghost. So this theory is not perfect in the sense of physical contents, but on the other hand, uh, it is renormalizable as uh, I discussed in this uh, uh, in this preprint. So you have to pay the price uh, for the renormalizability here and get your uh, neg uh, negative norm or negative kinetic energy states, which are people call ghost. And this is something uh, uh, interesting by itself because this theory has the same feature in this sense as quantum higher derivative quantum gravity. So, but its polynomial is much simpler theory. So maybe it's, it can be useful for something. I would say. But this in this talk I will not discuss it anymore. So uh, let us go to quantum theory. So first of all, uh, the I, I would mention our last uh, book. It's textbook with Buchbinder. Uh, which is a textbook on quantum gravity with exercises and all that. And the first thing we have to know about uh, quantum uh, theory of conformal fields is that uh, in some sense, conformal invariance holds in the one-loop divergences. The proof was given by Buchbinder in 84. Uh, it's not very easy proof, uh, and it was never generalized, not to higher dimensions, which would be very interesting to do, and not to, let's say, quantum gravity. So we don't have the proof. We know that in quantum conformal gravity, uh, divergences are conformal, at least for the basic model. But we uh, know this only from direct calculations. Uh, so this concerns divergences. But in the finite part of uh, one-loop effective action, the invariance is broken by anomaly. And this is uh, was discovered by Kapper and uh, Duff and Halpern in 74, then there are two very important papers by Desert Duff and Eichen and by Duff. So the question is, how we can combine these two things, that one-loop divergences are conformal and that uh, one-loop uh, finite part is non-conformal? And does it mean that necessary that higher-loop divergences are non-conformal? I will discuss this issue uh, in this talk. So, and the most provocative, I would say, question is, is it possible to have renormalizable uh, regardless it's anomalous theory? So, uh, no, ah, okay, I, I will. So uh, now we can formulate, uh, using this theorem by Buchbinder, we can formulate two types of conformal uh, invariance. First is what I call C-type conformal symmetry. So this is literally conformal invariant actions. And for example, the square of the wild tensor is one of those. Uh, or uh, in the matter field sector, all these examples which I show you were exactly of this type. They are uh, literally conformal invariant. But you can also have 
n type conformal invariant uh, terms, which n means not there. So this means that your action is not conformal invariant. However, it satisfies conformal not identity. And the reason can be because your action is surface term or it is a topological term, which is by the end of the day also surface term. So then this uh, identity will be satisfied simply because for surface terms, this uh, uh, variational derivative is zero. And for, uh, let's say, gauss bonnet term, this you can easily check that the trace is zero. So, uh, yeah, here we are. And uh, let us go to some examples. So, for instance, uh, if we want renormalizable theory of matter fields in curved spacetime, let me stress, not for a quantum gravity, but for matter fields, then the vacuum action should have the following terms. You necessarily need uh, Einstein-Hilbert term, cosmological term, and four uh, terms with four derivatives each. One is the square of the wild tensor. It is dynamical and conformal, as we know. Another one is R square, which is dynamical and non-conformal. And then you have topological term, which is called gauss bonnet invariant, and box R. So uh, we have all these terms. And out of these terms, only A1, C square, is uh, C-type invariant. And A2, E, and A3, box R, are N-type invariants. So if we start with the quantum theory of conformal matter field and look uh, as a one loop renormalization, then only these three terms will be renormalized. Other terms can be included or not, depends on you, because they don't define uh, a quantum theory. They are vacuum terms. They are just renormalized, but they don't define propagator vertexes and so on. So next, uh, how we uh, get the conformal anomaly? First of all, it's absolutely impossible to avoid conformal anomaly, uh, at least if you have divergences. If you have finite theory, it's questionable. So, so the net identity in the presence of matter fields is uh, has this form. There is here k phi is the weight, conformal weight of the fields. And then on uh, the mass shell for the scalar or other matter fields, you get this expression, which people used to call uh, 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 the stress of the energy tensor of vacuum. This is not a perfect uh, term because by the end of the day, we deal with the gravitational action. So why we attribute it to stress energy tensor? But this is a tradition to call it its way. And this tradition has many reasons. So let's keep this uh, expression. So then according to the theorem of conformal invariance, the one loop divergences have this structure. Uh, and then anomaly can be shown and I will show you in a few minutes that anomaly has this structure. So uh, here, beta 1 and beta 2 are the same in both cases. And A prime it may differ from beta 3 because of uh, ambiguities in the regularization procedure. I will also discuss this. So uh, from the very beginning, it's good to say that in many regularizations, like if you make... Um, cut off in the heat kernel representation or zeta regularization, uh, then A prime will be equal to beta 3 and there is no any ambiguity. But there are at least two regularizations uh, in which you have ambiguity. And in principle, uh, one can try to uh, invent uh, one more. Why not? Or two more. <laughs> okay, but it, uh, the second one was not easy. It was done by us, so I can confess that it was not easy at all. So let us first calculate anomaly. So the divergence, as I already mentioned, is like that. So here we have this famous uh, matrix with the contributions of scalars, uh, fermions, and vectors. And we see that here is very interesting um, universality because beta 1 is positive for all pa particle contents and beta 2 is negative for all particle contents. And beta 3 changes sign. Uh, between vectors and uh, scalars and spin spinners. So, in principle, uh, in, in the coefficients are calculated also for the wild square theory, and they are the same. This is plus, 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 and wild square gives you plus, and this guy gives you minus. And if you calculate for artificial fields like this Panates operator, then there is a flip of signs, and you have minus, minus, minus here, 
uh, mi minus in the first place, plus in the second place. And the same with three derivative fermion field. You can have flip of sign. Anyway, let's go on and make the following. Consider uh, one loop uh, renormalizable action of vacuum. It includes classical action of vacuum, which is conformal, gamma bar, which is uh, the naive before renormalization quantum contribution, which has uh, a divergent part, which is local, and a finite part, which is uh, unknown local. Both the sum is uh, conformal. You can find the proof in this book, Binder's paper, or simplify it in our book in Oxford Press. And then you have a counter term. And the counter term formally is the source of anomaly. Let me stress that it's formally, because in, in reality, uh, anomaly is hidden in this finite part. But formally, you can, as Duff did in 77, you can derive anomaly most easy in the most easier way uh, from the counter term. And the reason is in dimensional regularization, because uh, is that delta S is a local expression, and you have to make it n-dimensional. Okay, but if we use, let's say, uh, uh, cutoff in the heat kernel, then it is completely different mechanism to get anomaly, but anomaly is the same. So now the dimensional organization is the simplest one, so let's use it. So this trace, anomalous trace, is like that. So you have to take variational derivative from effective action, uh, uh, multiply by G menu, and then this reduced to the same operation with the counter term. And then we have the following. We note that this operator with the conformal shift of the metric is equivalent to taking derivatives with sigma with this parameterization of the metric. G bar is a fixed metric with a fixed determinant if you want. Then uh, it works for any uh, functional. And then if we make it for the square of the wild tensor, things are very explicit because we have one over n minus four because of divergence. We take derivative and sigma appears only exponential. Uh, derivative gives you n minus four, n minus four cancels with another n minus four, and we end up with the C square term in the anomaly. In principle, uh, other terms which can be uh, can be obtained in the same way anomaly, but uh, there are some subtleties which I prefer not to discuss. So by the end of the day, we have this form of anomaly. Uh, in, in the global uh, symmetry case, everything is very simple. So you have the same coefficient as uh, coefficient as beta, beta functions, as I mentioned. In the local case, it's more, much co more complicated because you have this problem. Box R in the divergences does not produce anomaly because the first derivative is zero. This was, uh, this is strange, let's say. Because this gives you, looks like a conflict between global and local conformal anomalies in the first place. And also, it is a conflict between formulas and our intuitive expectations. And we resolved this with uh, Manuel Asore and Eduard Gorber uh, 20 years ago. And because of this paper, I had certain problems with uh, journals and so on. But anyway, I believe it's correct. So then... Uh, we can use this uh, scheme and use this uh, classification to C square, uh, uh, C type invariant Gauss Bonnet and Box R, and make so called classification of the uh, terms. So it was done first time in Desert, Duff, and Nation paper, and then by Desert and Schwimmer and Desert in this uh, 2000, I think, put a final point on this story. So so uh, we, we have this classification of anomaly into three terms. It's interesting that this classification survives adding more uh, background fields. What I told you was only with the metric, but if you put extra scalar, extra vector, extra torsion, and so on, the classification remains. You st still have uh, real conformal invariants, C-type terms, one single uh, topological term, and maybe several uh, surface terms. And the coefficients have this universality, which I mentioned, which gave rise to the so-called C and A theorems. But these C and A theorems are trying to uh, generalize this universality of science uh, to the higher loops. However, this implies that the structure of anomaly does not break down when we go to the higher loops. And this means that this theory, conformal theory, remains renormalizable at higher loops. And this is a non-trivial issue because you may think that uh, if uh, one loop divergence is 
uh, will be uh, non-conformal, uh, will be uh, conformal, but there are finite non-conformal contributions, then two loop divergences should be non-conformal, and then the structure of anomaly will break uh, completely, break down. So let us discuss this uh, point. So in order to discuss it easily, we can go to integration of anomalies. That means we find some effective action which is responsible for anomaly. In two dimensions, this equation is well known. Uh, it's just t mu equal to r. In four dimensions, it's this equation which I mentioned. And my discussion will be on four dimensions because in two dimensions, it's too simple. So in two dimensions, the result is a famous Polyakov action. Uh, and you can get it easily, and there is nothing interesting, basically, because there is no C-type uh, invariant, of course, in two dimensions. But in four dimensions, you basically have everything. <laughs> you have, if you go to six, you don't get uh, much qualitatively new uh, details, let's say. So here we have the anomaly, and we start to integrate this anomaly. And for this, you need to note that, first of all, the C square is invariant, uh, Panate's operator is invariant, and we need this very interesting formula. This formula shows how to transform corrected topological invariant. So you have to take topological invariant Gauss Bonnet and subtract minus two third box R. If you ask me why minus two third, I would say I don't know, because uh, the answer is that uh, you have to calculate. There is no general scheme which enables you to, to obtain this coefficient. It's just a result of calculation. Still, the output is miraculous and strange because transformation of each of these two terms involves like two, three, four lines of formulas. And there are terms linear in sigma, quadratic in sigma, third order in sigma, and fourth order in sigma. Still, when you sum them with this coefficient, Everything cancels, and you get only linear term with the coefficient being the Panate operator. So after, if you have this formula, the rest of the integration is trivial. I will show you now. So first, you introduce the green function for the Panate operator. It is conformal green function. And then we note that product of conformal functional A, or function, you can say conformal function A, multiplied by this corrected topological invariant, the conformal variation gives you four uh, delta four Panate's operators multiplied by A. It's immediate consequence of this formula. Then we use these short notations and immediately can integrate C square term. We just multiply C square term by G and this guy. And then uh, you see that uh, Panate's operator cancels with the green function. And uh, after int taking integral over delta function, we end up with C square. So, uh, so we found the solution for the C-square term. Then we can make the same with this structure because uh, you need only first variation of sigma. So the non-invariance is, let's say, uh, not relevant. And we have uh, Im immediately our solution. And finally, R-square term we, uh, is, gives you a variation of R-square term of the local term, gives you box R, which means uh, we can have our general expression for the solution. It's very interesting expression because, first of all, it has uh, the integration constant, which is an arbitrary conformal invariant functional. This is something you cannot have in two dimensions. So it means that this effective action is not exact. It has this uh, arbitrary functional. It is exact only if we uh, consider a special, let's say, conformally flat metric, like in cosmology, then it is an exact quantum correction. And uh, so the rest is fine. We have here two different uh, green functions. Uh, you may say, no, they are the same. No, they are not necessarily the same because they are green functions of the same operator. But this does not mean that they are the same green functions because they may have different uh, boundary conditions. And sometimes it's uh, necessary to put different boundary conditions for these two operators. Once again, I will not discuss this. So we can uh, recast these non-local terms in the symmetric form, in the Gaussian form, and make it local, introducing two scalar fields, phi and psi. This was done for the first time by Oscar Jackson and me in 94. And this is very good because it, uh, for applications, it's certainly the best form of anomaly-induced uh, action. 
So you cannot have uh, something better than this, let's say. So you see it's local, it's simple, uh, just two lines. And, and if you have uh, this special uh, metric, you, it's exact. Moreover, if you then don't have special metric, is it true that this conformal functional is so important? I doubt this because actually this, uh, the rest of this uh, solution takes care about ultraviolet limit of the theory, of the leading logs, let's say. It's, you can say that this is a useful form of parametrizing leading logarithmic contributions. And since your original theory is massless, then all scales should be seen as ultraviolet, if, okay? So in principle, we can assume that this is uh, uh, potentially very, very useful expression. And in fact, for many application, applications, it works very well and gives you the same results as other methods. So let's say for classifying the black hole vacuum states, deriving corrections to the uh, uh, gravitational waves and things like that. Yeah. So this was done, as I said, by Oscar Jacksonaf and me. Then uh, Mazur and Matola had uh, equivalent results some years after. And uh, the advantage is that uh, these auxiliary fields are better uh, technically than imposing boundary conditions for the green functions. The rest is, of course, equivalent. So let us uh, make uh, some uh, general review. For instance, why 2 minus 2 short? And is it a general rule? For example, if you have uh, arbitrary uh, even dimension. So we know from the classification of conformal anomaly by Deser and Schumer, for example, that you always have set of uh, C-type terms, unique gauss bonnet term, and the set of surface terms. Okay, but uh, then uh, let's see in six dimensions, you have three conformal terms. It was done by Bastianelli, Fralov, and Zetlin. And uh, actually, uh, some work in some works by Branson, there were some hints how to get this. And uh, now we can say, okay, but is it true that in uh, six dimensions for this expression, you really have your uh, topological relation of our interest? And this is a conjecture. You cannot prove it. At least I don't know the proof. So <laughs> the conjecture is you can supplement your gauss bonnet invariant in arbitrary even dimension by some set of surface terms. And then your new corrected gauss bonnet invariant has this very simple rule of transformation. Why I believe to that? I don't know. I think if it is true in two dimensions, if it is true in four dimensions, it may be true in any even dimensions. So we formulated this as a conjecture in this uh, paper. And then it took some years to check it for six dimensions. It was done by my uh, student. He started when he was on the master course and finished when he was finishing PhD. So it took like four years of calculations, very, very big work. And we see that here in this case, there are uh, eight possible surface terms. They are related by neuter identity. Uh, this neuter identity is amazing because it corresponds to both conformal and diffeomorphism symmetries, the same identity. But then we found the solution with these coefficients. You can see that there are two arbitrary uh, parameters, uh, xi1, xi2, okay? And so we have our conjecture proved for six dimensions. Uh, I, I, as this student says, Fabricio, probably in eight, nobody will ever do it because it will be like 400 years calculation. So, yeah, this is the, Pane, uh, the analog of Panate's operator in uh, six dimensions. Uh, it was uh, obtained originally by Kenji Hamada in 2001. Technically, it's much easier to get this operator than to prove uh, this uh, uh, formula, which I told you about the topological relations. So uh, we fit with Hamada in this operator. It was nice. So now to integrate anomalies, the only remaining ingredient is uh, uh, the following. You have to say that you have to believe what's better say that for any surface term, there is a combination of local terms in the action which give you the corresponding surface term. And once again, there is no mathematical proof of this. That this should happen. This is a conjecture. But if this conjecture works, if this is true, and this works in six dimensions, then we can write an the solution for anomaly-induced action in arbitrary dimension. 
which is non-trivial. And once again, you have here uh, surf uh, general conformal functional arbitrary, and you have a solution for the uh, C-type terms. You have your corrected uh, invariant from the Gauss Bonnet, and you have uh, a set of local terms. Local terms. Good. In principle, this formula can be easily generalized if you add extra fields like extra electromagnetic field or extra Young Mills uh, in the, in the background or torsion or scalar or whatever else okay you can the generalization of this formula is almost automatic uh, but in in reality you need to work sometimes uh, but the main point is the transformation uh, fixed transformation rule for this corrected uh, gauss bonnet invariant so you can introduce two scalar fields auxiliary scalar fields it's again interesting that independent on dimension two fields are sufficient and you have this nice expression in the in six dimension good now let's go to new part is it true that uh, the conformal theories are really non-renormalizable uh, let us uh, remember known facts and they will bring us to the unknown thing so first we know that renormalizability depends on the type of the counter terms you need to cancel divergence in the given order of loop expansion then Ultraviolet divergences are always removed by adding local counter terms. People call it uh, Weinberg theory because Weinberg proved this uh, mathematically, but it was known long before, of course. Then we know that anomaly induced action has local and non local terms. And so it's very unlikely, once again, the no proof, that non local terms in the one loop effective action are capable to produce in the sub diagrams are capable to produce local divergences in the after superficial integration. I personally find it impossible. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, if we believe that this is not the case, then we can uh, drop non-local terms when we think about uh, divergences. And then it turns out that these local terms are very important. And I will show you now that they depend on the renormalization scheme and in principle on regularization especially. So it makes it very interesting and important to understand the ambiguities in the local terms, uh, starting from one loop, of course, because one loop is where we can do it. So how it works for dimensional organization? For dimensional organization, it's pretty easy. When you add C squared uh, counter term, you can put it in arbitrary D dimensions. Remember that real dimension in uh, dimensional organization is N, but you can put D equal to N plus something proportional to N minus four. In particular, you can make it d equal four and then uh, the counter the anomaly instead of c square gives you c square minus two short box r and uh, this was uh, this was noted in the pauli wheelers which i will show you next in this paper which i already mentioned so the standard solution of the it is that people say that adding local uh, finite counter term eliminates this problem and, and you can perfectly well eliminate box R term in the anomaly. This is true, but only in this particular case, because this is a vacuum action changing R square, as I said a couple of times already, you don't change quantum theory. So another example is pauli wheeler stabilization. You add uh, the set of N terms with different masses and with different statistics and uh, it turns out that uh, the result depends on the choice of these non-minimal parameters, Xi, because Xi don't need to be conformal. If we fix them conformal, there is no ambiguity. But in principle, you can uh, make it Xi. The regularization is removed when M goes to infinity and you get your, uh, your result. So let me show you the recent, very recent result of this uh, uh, in the uh, uh, pub, uh this uh, i think it is a wrong reference i put it today in the hurry so uh, it was european physical journal plus with the same authors i'm sorry <laughs> so uh, yeah this is the generalization for scalar fields in four dimensions so why i show you this formula because here we have this gamma phi it is a local term it is a local term but it is ambiguous because of gamma phi now pay attention that this local term, if we change it, okay, uh, we in principle may uh, start to modify even, uh, we can, uh, no, sorry, sorry, not this, this these two terms, we're not with gamma. These two terms are local, especially this R phi square, but it is uh, also ambiguous. 
and changing it changes quantum theory. So you cannot add a local finite counter term. It's absolutely uh, impossible here. I'm so sure. anyway, you have five minutes. Okay. So anyway, you have uh, here the same representation with two auxiliary scholars, which is easy to do. Then what we see is that this R phi square term affects the invariance of the quantum fields and produce non-conformal divergence in higher loops. This is well-known result from the epoch of Hasrell uh, more than 40 years ago. However, we know that this R phi square, which produced this uh, dramatic uh, violation of conformal invariance at higher loops in divergences, uh, is subject to some uh, ambiguity. So what we can say that if we elaborate a scheme of regularization, which define, uh, define it to uh, achieve fixing this ambiguity in the right way, then we can have we can expect to have uh, uh, completely conformal theory in all loops. I mean, as as concerns divergences, and then you can have your ANC theorems. But this would uh, require uh, special regularization and a lot of fine tuning for the randomization. Uh, procedure. So it's actually uh, non-trivial, but uh, not impossible either. And the last thing I want to mention is this anomaly-induced effective action in the infrared. It was pioneered by Gianotti and Matola, and then we did it for scalar field and another paper for torsion. So what means infrared, first of all? So we have to require to use anomaly that matter fields are approximately massless and conformal, then require this relation for the uh, for gravity, that gravity is uh, low energy gravity, and finally requires that linear in curvature terms always dominate over quadratic terms. And then we see that uh, green function for Panate's operator boils down to one over box square. This corrected uh, term becomes this, and finally we have this uh, reduced exp expression for the uh, induced action, infrared expression. And if we uh, take this expression and make a specially tuned conformal transformation, uh, we get effective potential out of anomaly, which was something we did not know how to do until last year. So uh, another detail is that if we assume uh, symmetry breaking gradient for a scalar field, then this expression, which was on the previous transparency, reduced anomaly induced expression, gives you R one over box R in four dimensions. This is interesting because these terms appear in many, many applications to cosmology. There was some a set of papers. I will not cite them now because I have no time. But there are a lot of uh, cosmological applications for this structure. And these people asked me at some point to find for them the scheme when it appears. And I, I can now say that this is the scheme. So let me go to conclusions because my time is uh, going to be over in a few minutes. So first of all, I hope I convinced you that integrating a formal anomaly is easy, beautiful, efficient, economic way to derive the effective action of vacuum. Uh, this uh, anomaly-induced action has absolutely nothing uh, from the part of the contents than the logarithmic uh, terms, the log of box terms, usual. But it's much more uh, elegant and economic uh, parameterization of this log. So in this sense, this for applications, it's of course much, much better. So another analogy is the randomization group correction to classical action. This is exactly a uh, local version of randomization group. So you can make uh, uh, easily generalizations with external scalar field and other fields, and even find the uh, link to the effective potential. But the local terms in the, your action are ambiguous, and this corresponds to the arbitrary choice of uh, initial point of randomization group flows in uh, in usual randomization group. So here we are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shapira. Who wants to ask questions? Yes, Professor no, Petrov. Nobody. Okay, then my question is very, uh, very simple. Uh, maybe not. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, beta function uh, in what uh, you have presented uh, conserves its sign. Uh, first of all, which sign is positive or negative? That's the... ah, okay, okay, good. So. Yeah, 
look to this formula. Uh, maybe it's better go couple of transparencies earlier when there are betas, yeah, because there are different notations. So you see, beta one is a beta function for the square of the wild tensor. Uh, please note that this is the beta function for the vacuum term, so the, the gravity is not quantum. But it's amazing that all three coefficients are positive. Okay, the statement is of this uh, so-called uh, C theory that if you add higher loop corrections up to non-perturbative level, uh, sum of all loops and so on, so this coefficient uh, still is positive and moreover it becomes greater. And beta two, beta two is always negative for spin zero, spin one half, spin one, and for the wild squared gravity. And once again, the statement is a theorem that this guy uh, uh, re uh, remains negative and becomes even uh, 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 more uh, magnitude increased, but the sign is still negative if you add higher loops. So in this sense, I was saying about the universality of signs. Okay, did I answer? Yes, thank you. Uh, please, Professor Manheim. Hello, um, Ilya. First of all, hello again, and thank you for hello. a very, very comprehensive presentation. I had a very small question. When you induced, at, you, at one point, you induced an action phi delta 4 phi. Uh, my question is, where did the phi come from? And obviously, it was going to, it's going to have to have uh, dimension zero. So how did you achieve that? Easily, because I, uh, I I don't find this phi. I introduce this phi and psi too. Psi is the same uh, yes. by hand. Because ah, okay. once again, we have your you have your induced action in this form, and you can write it in as a sum of two Gaussian structures. Ah, okay. Okay, yes. it's like a square plus two a b. Okay, and you write it as a plus b squared minus b squared. Okay. It's a kiddish uh, exercise, let's say. And then these two forms you can transform into local by introducing auxiliary fields. Okay, good. Yeah, now you were, so, you were... As you said correctly, these fields have zero dimension, and both of them are Panaeid fields, uh, like Fratkin Zetlin Panaeid, if you want. But they are uh, they have this type of coupling to this uh, C square and to uh, this structure. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, no, that... this scheme is absolutely universal, and this form is universal. So if you give me new term in the anomaly, I will immediately write in due section. You can do it by yourself, Rich. Okay. Good. No, your your answer was that the phi and the psi are auxiliary fields. That, that's exactly exactly. That's yeah. what I was missing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, any more questions? If not, thank you.